Good evening, friends. I'm Dr. Ajay Shah. We are bringing this another great light tonight. I have a, a great guest today who has actually led many of us in this uh, healthy lifestyle journey, particularly whole food, plant-based, no oil journey. Many of us, including some of even my own mentors, actually respect this guest so much more. They all attend his conference on an every year base. So I'm very excited to bring our guest today. Let me give you an update on our page first. We have now strong, solid 40,000 followers. Just in six months, we are expanding into different pillars of healthy lifestyle, not just healthy eating, exercise, and sleep, but many other pillars. So please reach out to our page to look at those pillars. We also are starting a healthy cooking demonstration with a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet with my wife. So this will be another exciting chapter on our page. So please uh, stay tuned for that. And let's start with our today's guest. Today's guest is Mark Huberman, president of the National Health Association, a, a great friend. So let's welcome Mark Huberman. Welcome, Mark. Pleasure to be here, Doc. That's great. Uh, first simple question. Where do you live and what kind of work you do? Well, I am a, a lifelong resident of Youngstown, Ohio, which is uh, halfway between Cleveland and Pittsburgh. So you're either, when you're in Youngstown, you're either a Cleveland Browns fan or a Pittsburgh Steelers fan or a Cleveland Indians fan or a Pittsburgh Pirates fan. And, but <laughs> um, we, had our, we had our moment of uh, glory when LeBron James brought us the NBA championship to the Cavaliers yes. a few years ago. Yes. But I've been lifelong in Youngstown and uh, I've been a lawyer for about 43, 44 years. And um, I retired from the general, from the practice of law in, at the end of uh, June in 2017 uh, to become the full-time executive, uh, president and executive director uh, for a time of the National Health Association. Um, I did everything for a while. Now my wife is the executive director and I'm the president and I edit Health Science Magazine. But uh, my legal career was, I was in the general practice of law for first 10 years. Second 10 years, I was a part-time referee magistrate of our juvenile court where I dealt with, you know, uh, neglected, dependent, abused children and, uh, and, and did everything I could to help make them, give them a better life. And then the next, uh, the next 20 years, I was the chief magistrate of the Mahoney County Domestic Relations Court where I was the, the our divorce court, our version of the divorce court. So I got to rearrange and uh, hopefully salvage a lot of lives that were in turmoil. And along the way, I became a, um, a, a trained mediator, and, uh, and, and which I think is in family law, uh, mediation is uh, where everyone should be because I think the adversary system in family law, especially where there's children involved, make them pawns and take, take people even that, uh, that can't get along, make them worse get along. And uh, mediation is a great way of helping people work out their, their solutions and their problems themselves. And, and uh, so I really enjoyed mediation. And even after I retired, I continue to do mediation for our local probate court for people that are in will contests and disputes over guardianships and things like that. And uh, so um, I've been, uh, as I say, in, in the legal career, uh, my whole career, I've done a lot of work with the Supreme Court of Ohio in making changes in the law. I've sat on a number of commissions and I've done continuing education for lawyers and magistrates and judges. And so I've had a very uh, rewarding career. Yes, no, I can see that. I think uh, that speaks completely of what kind of person you are. Because when we earlier talked on the phone a few weeks back, I realized that for you, compassion and passion are the two important words. The way you value all live beings, obviously you value the human lives most. And that's where neglected children, some of the, you know, some of the difficult relationship issues and all those things need person like you, need a magistrate like you, because uh, many times simple misunderstandings, you know, dissolves a lot of the marriages. And I think if there is a mediator who can dissolve, you know, many times I sincerely believe that many judge and many magistrate almost need a psychology degree because many of these marriages are not because of any, you know, a real bad situation. It's many times because of the long-term misunderstanding. So I think, uh, I think I really, really admire the way you took up on being the uh, in a profession and uh, leaving your private practice. So I think uh, let's start with the who's in your family. I see your wife. Who else is in your family? So I have uh, we have three children. Uh, I have uh, uh, my daughter Lisa, who's a starving artist in New York, 
uh, works at Trader Joe's, writes plays, teaches at uh, City College of New York. My daughter Heather is a uh, uh, works as a uh, clerk, a case manager in our local juvenile court where I used to work years ago. Uh, and so she does that kind of rewarding work. And then um, we raised my niece, she's not my daughter, but we raised my niece since she was 10 years old. And she's a real star in our family. And she is also uh, making a difference. She's a uh, case manager uh, of uh, Summit County Children's Services. It's in Akron, Ohio, Summit County. And she's uh, rising up through the ranks and she recently got married. I had the privilege of walking her down the aisle and she's a great kid, got a great husband. And uh, so life is good. So there's, there's that is, uh, a, you know, that is a great, yeah. beautiful girl. So let me ask I didn't you know the secret of having a boy. I just, three girls, yeah. Maybe you know the secret. Yeah. And we have a son and a daughter. So I, yeah. And you got the secret. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you a billion trillion dollar question. Number one, how many years or decades, you've been whole food, plant-based, no oil. And in my opinion, you will have a century of whole food, no, whole, whole, whole food, plant-based, no oil. So tell, you, tell us how many decades? Well, let me, let me qualify it just a little bit. I, I, am, I have been whole food, plant-based for all of my 69 years. I just turned 69 on June 26th of this year. And for the first, believe it or not, for the first 32 and a half of those years, I was a complete raw foodist. So raw fruits and vegetables was all that I ate. That's how I was raised from day one. And that's the only thing I did. And I, so I've never had a piece of pizza. I've never had a, a, a glass of milk. I've never had any of those uh, sort of thing. Never had a thing of uh, ice cream. And uh, even though I started eating cooked foods when I was 32 and a half years old, I'm still a pretty simple guy. The only qualification I would give to that is that when I grew up, um, my parents had a health food store and in the whole food plant-based movement, um, olive oil and corn oil, crude, cold pressed oil was not such an issue. Nobody, it, it just wasn't, there wasn't the concern about it. So I did, you know, I used oil as a kid. That was my salad dressing, uh, on my salads. Um, but as I grew older and as probably when I was 18, 19 years old, the, 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 um, uh, the health movement kind of evolved. We've learned, you know, we've, we've disregarded some old notions, we've gained some notions. And so I, I learned that oil was just pure fat, had no place in the diet. And so for probably since I was 18 years old, I've barely had any oil. Maybe if I'm at a, at a restaurant and there's the lettuce tastes terrible, there's no salad, I might put a little drop of olive oil on, but I don't fool myself and think there's anything healthful about it because there's nothing healthful about it. And so I, I would say that uh, I am, uh, I live SOS free and I've been that way virtually my whole life with the exception of some oil when I was a child, but never had a piece of meat, never had a piece of fish, never had a piece of chicken. Um, so I, I've had a very unusual uh, and fortunate- I think, uh, I, think that, I think that's a rarity this days and age. Even though when I grew up in India, being vegetarian, we had a fair amount of our dairy. And I think we are all realizing now, not just health-wise, but in terms of uh, animal suffering. You know, I think the way you, dairy farming used to be done 500,000 years ago has completely changed now. It's pretty much uh, such a factory size dairy farming now that I think all the cows and all the other animals suffer so much. So I think to me, I think uh, you were the kind of a early pioneer of this uh, kind of thinking. And I think uh, many people tell me that it sometimes comes because of the health aspect, like one person wants to be healthy. But I think a lot of people do this thing because of the animal cruelty as well as the health. So I think, uh, so in your case, you just told us that your parents had a health food store. So it must be one of the early, early health food store. And how much of your parents' influence was on you? Were your parents also vegan? You know, it's an interesting thing. So when I was born, my parents were very new to this business. Your, your colleague, um, Dr. Kim Williams, had a great saying uh, when I interviewed him for our Health Science Magazine. He said, you know, the two most, uh, most common predictors of people becoming vegan is a health crisis and having a daughter who's a vegan. <laughs> Those are the two things that kind of get people to change their life and more and more kids for, and their daughters more for animal rights reasons are doing that. And then it evolves in the health reasons. My parents, uh, when I was, when my, I have an older brother and when he was born in 1948, when my parents, shortly after my parents were, were married, 
he had health problems, my father had health problems, my mother had health problems, and they were kind of at the end of their rope. My father had contracted polio and just wasn't a guy that could accept that kind of fate. Uh, and my mother is the same. And so they, they became vegetarians. Uh, they bought a juice machine. They both recovered their health. And then I come along uh, in 1951 and they were very enthusiastic about this lifestyle. But in 1951, it wasn't a very popular thing to not want to give vaccinations to your children. It wasn't a very popular thing to not want to give them cow's milk. Uh, and my mother and the family at that time put my parents under an enormous amount of emotional pressure, called the health department on my parents for raising their children as vegetarians and things like that. My mother was a very emotional sort, was trying to nurse me in the very natural, normal way that you know we all preach that it should be done today. She got emotionally um, uh, affected by it. Her milk spoiled as she was trying to nurse me, at least that's the story they tell me. And I got very, very sick, almost died. I uh, had a, a, a condition they tell me is now is projectile vomiting where I couldn't keep any food down. Fortunately uh, for, for me, for my parents, there was two of the founders or three of the founders of our association uh, of the National Health Association, formerly called the American Natural Hygiene Society, uh, were lecturing in Cleveland. And a friend that my father worked for was an ardent vegetarian, said, Max, look, why don't you come listen to this lecture about this guy? Introduced me to Dr. Benish and Dr. Shelton, Dr. Gross from New York. And those guys, especially Dr. Benish, um, just kind of was Dr. Benish to the rescue. And he way ahead of his time in terms of uh, the emotional side. You know, you talk about the pillars of health that you have on your thing here. Well, there's an emotional side. Stress can be a big factor. And he said to my mom, look, you know, the first thing you got to do is have somebody that, that's calm, that can hold your son. Just because the reason he's not holding any food down is not because he's got some congenital problem, but probably because you're sick, you're stressed, and yes. maybe try a little raw goat's milk, try some simple, simple foods, simple mashed foods. The short story, making a short, a long story short, um, I got through that crisis. My parents uh, got their, kicked their family members out of the house. <laughs> I got through the crisis and because I got through and my parents kind of believing that the natural hygiene lifestyle, which Dr. Benish and Dr. Shelton and Dr. Gross promoted, was the pristine way of life. And they just maybe not even fully understanding or even following this themselves, decided the pristine Sheltonian natural hygiene diet was raw fruits and vegetables. Those were live foods. Those were on whole foods, what we call today whole food plant-based. They were whole foods and that's the way they raised me. So even though amazingly, they were just vegetarians, weren't even vegans. My older brother was, you know, not even raised the way I was. They raised me on raw fruits and vegetables, even when they didn't. And because it's the only thing I knew and loved and enjoyed, it didn't matter to me. Taste is a learned behavior. So that's why I was for going through grade school, high school, everything else. And I never, I was always a pretty, if you knew my parents, um, we we're all very confident kind of people. Uh, you yes. know, don't really worry too much what other people think about you. Uh, yes. You're comfortable in your own skin. You believe what you believe, whether you're, whether, you know, whether we're our Judaism, our pacifism, our veganism, be proud of what you believe in. That's how they were. So I was yeah. proud of the way I grew up. And, um, and that's just, that's the way I was. So I grew up kind of unique, even in my own family. But as I got older, my parents, like most people, it's a journey. And for my parents, probably when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, they became vegan, they became stricter and they became, you know, so they kind of, they kind of caught up to me. <laughs> no, I think that's an, that's an impressive, impressive story, an impressive life for your parents. I think, uh, and uh, let me ask you uh, first a simple question. I think your parents lived long. Your mom lived up to 96, wasn't it? My mother passed away in her sleep at 97. 97. My that just passed away when he was 86. That just speaks for your mom average 15 more years than an average American female and your dad about eight to 10 years longer than an average American male. And I think if they had started this thing earlier, they could have even crossed 100. 
And that's well, a, I mean, the question. I mean, they lived 50 years of their lives were lived conventionally. So, yeah. you know, they, they had to bear that burden a little bit. But my mother, more impressively about my mother, is that when she died at 97 in her sleep, she had no diabetes. She had no <laughs> hearing aids. She was on no wow. medication. She wow. was, she, she had some short-term memory things like I think most of us do when we get to be 97. Yes. But she was intact and ambulatory and exercised and did all those sort of things. So to me, uh, you know, age is, is an interesting phenomenon, but there's, you know, tons of people in nursing homes uh, that are living to old age, but they're not living. They're, they're I think that's in their a, warehouse. That's that's a, such a such a powerful statement you made that your mom was 97, no medications, healthy, active, uh, you know, good good hearing. I mean, uh, to me, that speaks just like a blue zone, just like some of the people in Loma Linda and Okinawa. And I think those things can be achieved in America. And your mom is a shining example. And I think you are following your parents' footsteps, and that brings a, a thing I heard in one of your other video that you made a comment that if a child or if a kid or if an infant uh, is raised from day one with a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet, that person will have a lot more ease in life following that lifestyle. So I think, let me, let me ask you a question. What is your appeal to some of these younger parents who are raising young newborns and some of the younger kids what is your advice to them in terms of getting them an early start with this whole food, plant-based, uh, healthy lifestyle? Well, I think a couple of things. First, I think that uh, when, when you said about my own, my own circumstances, I was interviewed by your friend, Chef AJ, who interviewed you. And, and she said that the, the book that I should write should be called Don't Get Started. Yes. And when you don't get started on these kinds of, 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 of dopamine affecting uh, foods. Uh, pleasure trap foods, you're not going to be in the pleasure trap. Uh, I think, uh, I guess what I say and, and where I think whether I was raised as a vegan or not, I was raised, my father had a big, huge, beautiful garden in his backyard and he had a compost pile way back when. So, I mean, I learned the beauty of nature, picking what's, what's more magical than picking a strawberry when it's glistening in the morning or a cherry tomato or or, or, or a beautiful pepper or things like that. So I think that's a sensitivity and a sensibility that, that if children get raised with rather than fast foods and junk food and cotton candy and all these other sort of things, I think you, you gain an appreciation of nature. I also think that, that if you are raised in day one as a vegan, I think you will have a, no guarantees in life but I think you will be, um, I, I think you will have an affinity and an empathy for animals, for the world around you. You'll look, when you watch, when you watch Bambi uh, or, you know, or, or a Disney movie you, or Lady and the Tramp, you'll, you'll look at those animals differently. Um, you won't, I, I know when I, when I grew up, uh, I could never understand and to this day, I can't say that I really understand people that hunt. Not that every hunter, I mean, I have some really great friends that go out and hunt. They just, there's just a sensibility that's lacking. They just don't see the world the way I see the world. And I think, so my, coming back to your question, I think if parents raise children from day one with an appreciation for the bounty of nature, not just in terms of food, but in terms of wildlife and the environment and all that, I think they'll turn out to be pretty intact human beings and they'll be kind and they won't be racist and they won't be bigoted and no guarantees, but I think you, you're, 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 um, you're, you're controlling, you're, you're, you're affecting their destiny a great deal emotionally as well as uh, nutritionally. No, I think uh, you made some excellent points. I think uh, when we have a pet at home and then when we have animal products at home, particularly meat and fish, I think that to me almost uh, makes me feel like there is a, almost like a hypocrisy. I think uh, how can you love one animal but not love the other animal? So I think to me, you know, people need to start thinking on that line. Plus, I think I agree with you. I think uh, the kids take parents as a role model. And I think uh, for them, whatever parents do and whatever parents teach them, those foundations, those uh, stones in the foundations are ingrained from like early age. 
And if they learn the right way of living, not just with healthy eating, but with exercise, with stress management, with relationship, with, uh, with a love and compassion, they actually end up becoming a better human being. And they, I mean, we have a data now. They're not only, they are happier, they make other people happy, they live long, but they make actually world a better place. So I think as a parent, we have a large responsibility and we took it, you took it, you actually took additional responsibility of your niece. So I think to me, it commands you that not only you continue your parents' uh, uh, baton and torch light, but you also followed with your own kids. And I think uh, I, I actually ask many parents today to listen to this again and again and get your kids on a healthiest lifestyle. Don't stop at any intersection or every intersection where there is a chicken nuggets and fast food sitting there. Those things are going to kill your kids in their 30s and 40s. Childhood obesity is on rampant now. Childhood type 2 diabetes is growing exponentially. So we need to be very careful. Children are our future. I think, uh, and I think we need to listen to people like you. So that brings a next question to you, which everybody wants to hear. What did you eat yesterday or today? Describe your day. What did you eat? Well, um, I I start most days with uh, when I, when I have the time. I start most days. I like overnight oatmeal. I make it the night before, and you know, with with uh, my own. You make my I make my own almond milk. You know, I've never understood. I this is just a little pet peeve of mine, but I've never understood um, that why people will spend you know, three, four dollars for a bottle of almond milk, which is certainly better than cow's milk to put on their oatmeal. When you can take, as Chef AJ will say, a tablespoon of almond butter and a blender and a cup of water, and you have better tasting almond butter, <laughs> almond milk. And, it, and if you look in most almond milks, I think there's one good one at Trader Joe's that they actually have that's actually almonds and water, but most of them have like 10 different ingredients in it. You think you're getting yeah. almond milk. Most of these nut milks are that way. Um, it's, a, it's kind of an odd thing, but anyway, so I, I, I make my overnight oatmeal in, in, uh, in almond milk and I cut up fruit into it and some, some bananas and some, and I usually try to have a, a combination of chia seeds, flax seeds and, and, um, and, uh, uh, and hemp seeds. It just kind of has a nice staying power for me in the morning. I also have always, I don't know, just grew up liking cantaloupe. So I have, I have a bowl of cantaloupe in the morning. I've always liked that. And that usually sustains me pretty good, especially the overnight oatmeal. Would, when you have some nuts, you know, some uh, ground up seeds and that, it's, it sustains you. I think if you just ate the oatmeal or if you just had a bowl of fruit, you're going to be hungry as the, day, as the day wears on. Most lunches, I like, um, I like to make uh, a pita pocket and I get the, the healthiest whole wheat, lowest sodium whole wheat pita pocket that I can find. And I make, uh, I, I mash up an avocado and put some sprouts and some, cut up all kinds of vegetables and put it in the pita and heat it up. And, uh, and I really enjoy that. So I have a couple of pitas for lunch. And then I make um, the, best, uh, the best and healthiest, uh, most natural oatmeal, raisin, and peanut butter chocolate chip cookies with no added oil, salt, or sugar. It's a Kathy Fisher recipe. There's a couple of variations on it. But I usually have that in like a peach or a nectarine, especially right now at this time of year when they're they're in season and that's my lunch. And that's a pretty satisfying lunch most days. And dinner has been the same for my whole career. I have a very, very large salad with all kinds of every kind of vegetable you can think of. Uh, I love avocado. Avocado was my butter growing up and I still love avocado. And I usually uh, have a, a, I'm a pretty simple guy but I've got a couple of dressings that I enjoy. And the, one of my favorites is again, a Kathy Fisher tahini dressing that has uh, just equal parts of oranges, lime, and lemon juice with a, a tablespoon, a couple of tablespoons of tahini, maybe a few cashews for the hell of it, a shallot, a shallot, blend it all up. And I have that for, I have that on my salad as a nice dressing, beets, there's no oil in it, there's no salt in it, there's no sugar in it. And that's right. And then usually after that, I'll have, again, depending on the day, some yams, a baked potato. My wife just made a, a, an amazing, um, lasagna and instead of using noodles she used sliced zucchini instead of the noodles and um, it was fabulous and it's very very satisfying and I I can't say that I ever go hungry and I think anybody that comes to visit the Hubermans they never go hungry either <laughs> we, we eat well we eat well we enjoy what we eat and um, so that's uh -huh. a typical that's a typical day in uh, dog patch as they say 
Yeah, no, I think uh, your day, actually, to be honest with you, is one of the most spectacular eating day because when people eat processed food, fast food, animal products, they typically will have four or five different tastes, typically sugar, salt, fat, and maybe some other one or two other tests. They may have a soda or something with it. While when the people eat vegetarian food or whole food, plant-based vegan food, they have option of picking 300,000 edible plants, number one. Number two, we know now that our microbiome, the bacteria in the colon, needs all different type of plant-based food, particularly soluble fiber. And that's where adding all varieties, including some intact grain is very important because there are certain bacteria in the bowel, in the colon, rely on this grain-based soluble fiber. So when people say the grain are bad, that's not true. I think we need all different type of plant-based food, as long as they're intact grain with a whole soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. And your day actually, probably my guess is about 60 to 70 gram of fiber. Well, I got to tell you that I, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, baked potatoes and yams and, uh, but I'm a pretty simple guy. So I love, I'd love just the bowl of lentils and some steamed vegetables with it. I love split peas. I, in fact, peas, split peas and fresh peas are my favorite food in the world. In fact, the happiest moment of my uh, 69th birthday was that in my garden in the backyard, the peas, the English shell peas were in full bloom and, um, so I love that, but I agree with you about intact grains and that, and I love them. And again, in terms of something that's, that's satiating, satisfies you, fills you up, gives you, leaves you a great aftertaste, um, quinoa and, and wild rice and, and uh, lentils. And there's so many different kinds of lentils these days and split peas, yellow split peas, green split peas. Yes. It's just uh, anybody that says that there's no variety or that this life is boring, uh, hasn't tried it. Yes. So let me ask you next question. You already answered it partly, but it sounds like you are a good cook. So how often do you cook? And uh, what is your favorite dish when you cook? Well, I, I take that back. I wouldn't say that I'm a good cook. My wife is a much better cook than me. I, I grew up, in fact, she, will, she would tell you, if you interview my wife, she would tell you that when, you know, for the first 20 some years of our marriage before she kind of joined me a whole hog on this, on this voyage, um, to me, a baked potato was a baked potato and a yam or some steamed rice and that I could do that pretty good. I, I, you won't find me making a lasagna. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you'll find me making some good vegetable soups, but I'm not yeah. a very sophisticated cook. I can make my, you know, five ingredient oatmeal raisin cookies and that kind of stuff, but I'm not, a, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not a cook. Um, I enjoy eating what other people cook. Yes. Uh, and in fact, on my 65th birthday, I had never had a cake in my life. And my wife made me again, a, one of Kathy Fisher's straight up food carrot cake, made it into a carrot cake with a, with a pineapple icing on it. And, uh, uh, and I enjoyed that thoroughly, I want you to know. Yeah. But I've been a simple guy most of my life. And even to this day, I, I, I'm a, because I've been a public figure a good part of my life, I go out to eat a lot uh, or I'm invited to dinners. And I mean, it's fine. I have a baked potato, some steamed vegetables. I always have an avocado in my pocket just in case. Yep. <laughs> um, but that's, I'm, I've always been, uh, say in terms of my palate, it's relatively simple. And, um, my father, my late great father had a great saying, he said, son, if something has more than five ingredients in it, don't buy it. <laughs> don't eat it. <laughs> and it's just, uh, there's a simplicity, simplicity about this way of living and whole food really means whole food. whole food. Unprocessed really means unprocessed. And so the closer we get to that model, uh, I think the better we're gonna be. And fortunately, uh, again, unlike when I grew up, there's so many great recipes available today that you can make simply and not complicated. Brittany Giroudi, whose recipe, the Giroudi family on YouTube, uh, who's featured in the upcoming, in the issue of health science that just came out. I mean, just shows you how easy it is to do this, but I'm not the cook, I'm the eater. <laughs> yeah. No, I think Brittany is coming on our page too, I think in a few weeks. So I think we're all excited. I think, uh, I think we essentially need to create a team where we support each other, educate each other, lead each other, you know, make each other healthier. And also I think take other people in our wings and I think make this thing one day a real, real large, large uh, 
part of our population. Like right yeah. now, vegan movement is growing exponentially, but it's still unfortunately about five or six percent. So I think, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of other forces come in when people prefer the certain type of a diet, including like I was just telling you earlier, keto diet in last five to 10 years has grown up so much in popularity, even though it probably is one of the unhealthiest diet. But I think, uh, like I always say, people love hearing good news about their bad habits. And I think uh, they, they think keto is their savior and keto makes you lose weight for a month or two. But then I think that then it's gonna be a lot of issues. So my next question to you is, I was reading a report that people whose body mass index, which we calculate based on a weight and height, body mass index is kind of steady, particularly around 21 or so since their high school, they actually have a very high chance of living up to 100. So give us your body mass index in high school, your body mass index now, and what is the secret? Well, I can't tell you, I've never measured my body, uh, my, my BMI, I, I've, I rarely take my blood pressure. I don't, I don't get, I don't really worry about things. The best thing I can tell you is that I haven't changed significantly since I graduated from high school. I'm not much more in weight. I am not much, I don't think I've, my, my hair is a little grayer. I got a little bit of a receding hairline a little bit, but I haven't changed significantly since high school. And um, so I, I, I've never, I guess I've, you know, in, in today, Everybody says, well, what's your cholesterol? What's your this? What's your that? I do get my blood checked every couple of years just for the hell of it to, to make sure that I'm not going to keel over tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I've been pretty normal. I do supplement B12. I do supplement B vitamin D when I read low. But uh, I, I've, never, I've never taken my body. My, there's not a lot of, uh, there's no fat on Mark Huberman. Let's put it that way. So doing a body, uh, doing a BMI, uh, measure wouldn't really tell me very much, but to short answer the question, I've never taken it. So I couldn't tell you, but I just know for people that know me, you look at my pictures when I graduated from law school and from high school, I'm not that different. And, actually, and, and, actually, and, the... and logically so, because I have followed a life sustaining, life preserving, um, longevity producing diet and lifestyle. I, I firmly believe that. And I, I don't feel like I'm 69 years old. Um, and I don't plan on feeling like that for a while. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think to, to repeat what you said, it's been 50, what, 51 years since your high school graduation. And you probably had a Body mass index, my guess, looking at you today, was probably about 21, 22. And you, you maintain right. that body mass index, even though you did not measure the body mass index, the weight itself, because people's height don't change. So if your weight did not change, your body mass index did not change either for 51 years. And that's a, one of the biggest predictor of not just health, but longevity. So I really, really command you, you know, most of us, including myself, most of us have gained about... Uh, anywhere from 10 to 15, 20 pounds since our high school. Some well, people only, even more. The only thing that's changed with me is I've actually put on a few pounds in the last three or four years because you know I think we can all do better. I'll try to do better every day uh, on, on lots of levels. And, uh, and one of those levels is exercise. I think as you get older, so I go to a personal trainer three days a week. I do heavy lifting, I do some cardio. Uh, because I think that's all, you know, one of those pillars of health, like you say, healthy eating, exercise, sleep. Um, I, I do that pretty religiously. When I was younger, I played racquetball. Uh, even when I was in college, I played racquetball. I don't, I, I don't have the opportunity to play so much now, but I exercise diligently. My wife and I walk a lot. Um, we, we, we stay active. Let's put it, we bike ride. We, we do things like that. But I put on a few pounds because I have, and I think the, the older you get, I think you need a little cushion, uh, especially when you're lean, as I've been and as, as, as I've been most of my life. I think having that cushion as you get older, if you slip and fall or if you, you know, it's a helpful thing to do. Plus, it's certainly got to be good for your physiology. I know that's one of the pillars of health. So we can all do better. And I try to do better. That's one area that I've tried to evolve. And obviously, it's a little easier when you retire. You have a little more control of your life. Um, so I do that, but I'm pretty religious about, about going to the gym and, and exercising. And if I even, if I miss a day because I got a conflict or an appearance somewhere, 
I'll go the next day. I'm doing those three days a week, no matter what, because. Yeah, I think that, that that speaks uh, so high because uh, physical activity is as important as all the other pillars and including sleep. So I think uh, if a person wants to be healthy, they have to follow all the pillars because when a person does not sleep well at night, next day, invariably, they eat very unhealthy food. That's how our hormones behave. And when we don't exercise, we, many times we come in the evening with all the stress built up throughout the day without the endorphins we get from exercise, we invariably have emotional stress eating. So I think all those uh, pillars, they actually go in concert and they actually exponentially increase the value of each other. Well, I think also, I think also as you get older, I think, you know, as you do start part, start to wear out a little bit. So you want to compensate for that as best you can. You do it nutritionally. You do it through exercise. You know, your colleague, uh, Dr. Joel Kahn, when I interviewed him for the magazine, he said, you know, he said um, that healthy eating is the king and exercise is the queen. And you need to have both. And yeah. he's right. He's right. Yeah. Those are two yeah. top, top pillars. As, as uh, John McDougall or somebody said, you know, you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet, but exercise can sure supplement a good diet. Good diet. Yeah, I think Joe, Dr. Joe Khan is coming in like two weeks on our page too. We are bringing all these great people. Thanks to you and thanks to everybody. So he's um, a fun guy. Yeah, he's very smart. He's like a he's like a computer of all the data. He remembers so much statistics. I and mean, he's I'm, got a great sense of humor. Times. It's a great sense of humor too. Great sense of humor too. Yeah, yeah. My next question too is in terms of stress management, do you do any meditation or yoga or anything like that? I do not. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm a touchy feely kind of guy for, for those sort of things, but I would say that uh, uh, my own assessment of myself is that I never go too high and I never go too low. I'm a, you know, they have an old saying that you need something done. You go to a busy person. I've been a public citizen. Most of my career, I've been involved with, in addition to practicing law and being a magistrate judge, I've been involved with, community theater and legal aid and all kinds of programs. And to this day, I, I still am involved in a lot of, uh, of corrections boards in our area. And I, in our local synagogue, I'm president of our synagogue right now. And I've just learned to, to um, again, not go too high, not to go too low. I kind of compartmentalize well. And I think one of the things that I've done pretty well diet-wise or lifestyle-wise is that I've just kind of learned to know my body pretty good. I rarely get sick. I'm not saying I'm Superman and I'll get a cold from time to time and I'll, you know, I'll get a headache or something like that. But I've kind of learned, and maybe it's the natural hygiene upbringing in me, that I know your body's telling you something and it's time to just stop. It's kind of like, you know, the, in, in natural hygiene and in the, in, the, in the National Health Association, we've always been proponents of water fasting. But the, and, and most people think of water fasting as some sort of a diet, that there's something magical in the water, but it's really not that. It's the essence of water fasting as a physiological rest where you just stop life and you just let your body heal itself. And if you look at animals in nature, you know, when a dog is sick, they curl up and they go to sleep and they curl up in the floor and that's what they do. They don't eat. And so on a, but on a broader scale, I think just for Mark Huberman, I've just sort of learned where my limits are. And when I push too hard, um, I know it's time to slow down, smell the roses. And uh, so I've always balanced things pretty well. I think most people will say that I, 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 I'm not an emotional sort of guy. I mean, I'm not emotional. I don't mean I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I don't get angry. I don't get, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a, um, a road rage guy. I don't slam on the horn with somebody. I say, what the hell is that guy doing? You know, I was just more amazed by the crazy things people do. And I think um, I, I get that a lot from my father, who was, uh, who was very comfortable in his own skin and just kind of thought, I, I grew up with a, 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 a philosophy. And this kind of goes back to something earlier, but my father was a fan of, um, of, uh, his favorite, one of his favorite authors in the world was Horace Mann, who's the father of public education. There's a statue to him in Boston Commons in, in, in Boston. And he was famous for a, a quotation that be ashamed to die until you've won some victory for mankind or victory for humanity. And I've kind of lived that way. It's part of what I do for the NHA. I think trying to bring this message to more people, 
but I, I take that to lots of levels and you got to keep, I think the way you, the way you convince people in the world is, uh, you know, listening, trying to listen more and, and being a good listener and trying to empathize with people. So I've never run too high. I've never run too low. And I think that's served me well, but well, I, think, I, uh, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't meditate. Um, my, my spirituality is when I'm in the garden early in the morning and looking yes. at picking weeds out of my cherry tomatoes and, and, and picking tomatoes and things like that. I find that very spiritual and very relaxing for me and being well, out I in think, nature. I think I agree with you. I think, uh, we don't necessarily need 20, 40 minutes of meditation setting. If you make your whole day as if you are meditating, like, for example, you said being in a garden is a form of active meditation. Being a public servant is a form of active meditation. And to be honest with you, like when I do all these lives with all these great guests, I feel like I'm in a zone. I'm like, I'm in a flow. I, this is like my best meditation. I absolutely enjoy it. I still practice some meditation, but to be honest with you, I'm just like you. I think this gives me more relaxation than actually even doing meditation. I think talking to you is relaxing as much as when I meditate. So I agree with your philosophy that I think meditation doesn't have to be sitting and closing your eyes. Meditation can be your whole life, actually, whole every day, every second you could be meditating. So I think that's a good, let me ask you the next question. And based on your personal experience, based on what you have read, based on your friendship with all these great giants in healthy lifestyle, please tell us if a person starts a healthy lifestyle with a whole food plant-based diet, what kind of chronic disease that person can avoid in next five, 10, 20, 30 years? Almost all of them, almost all of them. I mean, I think the, the, we know today that heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, um, arthritis, all of these things are, 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 are diseases of, of lifestyle, of bad lifestyle decisions. And they not only, the, I think the most impressive thing in my years is that not only have we been preaching how all this can be avoided, but the more impressive thing is the science of epigenetics today, that even if you've not been obeying the rules and have been violating all the rules of living and just didn't, weren't aware of, of the benefits and the blessings of this lifestyle, it's for many, it's not too late. You can, you can get over your heart disease, you can get off your medication that doctors will tell you you have to be on for the rest of your life. You get off, you can get off your insulin that, that diabetics are told they have to be on for the rest of their life. You can get off of your stress medication. I, I, I've just seen it my whole life. And fortunately now, fortunately today, there are so many physicians like you validating what people like my parents just did as a matter of belief and common sense and it, it just sort of and, and watched observationally at work. But now there's Caldwell Esselstyn's and Joel Kahn's and Joel Furman's and Alan Goldhammer's and, and, and Columbus Batiste's and, and just more and more every day are validating, you know, scientifically documenting, but also articulating persuasively the value of this lifestyle. So the short answer is I think that virtually all of the conditions that are so afflicting America today, the COVID-19, I think everyone agrees that, in, that one thing everybody does agree on is that the people that are most at risk with COVID-19 are those with these comorbidities, people with high blood pressure, people with the shame of it is that Dr. Fauci and all of the, uh, this coronavirus task force, there's no plant-based physicians saying, hey, wait a minute, where is the real risk here? The real risk here is that people are leading these unhealthy lifestyles. That's gonna be the real solution to this. I'm not concerned, Mark Huberman, if I contract the coronavirus. Maybe I already have it. I don't know. But I'm not worried that I'm going to suffer because I know my body, I'm pretty confident my body will be able to handle it. But I am concerned for a lot of other folks. But I'm, but if, if only we could get, the, and, and, you know, so a lot of people are making some very nice petitions and trying to wake up the world to that. Neil Bernard has just led this national petition to have a plant-based physician added to the coronavirus task force because everybody agrees the people that are most at risk are those most at risk yes and they don't have to be that's yeah, the that, shame of it all that's the yeah, crime that, it's almost the crime of it all right yeah that's because we're all paying a price we're all paying a price the whole economy's been shut down everything 
and it need not be. The coronavirus is a no question it's out there, no question it's, it's troublesome, maybe more contagious and more viral and more aggravating for people to get it. But I, my own belief in a lifestyle and, and my, my own experience of 69 years on this planet that, uh, that the coronavirus or, or bird flu or swine flu or all these, we, we're, we're meant to endure these things and overcome them. But for people that, that have compromised immune systems, they're not so much. And that's why the, our, the message of our lifestyle from the National Health Association that you're promoting, that Chef AJ and that so many other great people are doing is so vitally needed right now, more than ever, more than ever before. Because I think we've been playing Russian roulette with factory farming, with these wet markets and all that, but also not just that, but also these generations that have been raised now on adulterated, what my father would call foodless foods. We, we need to wake up. We need to wake up before it's too late. It is too late for a lot of people, unfortunately, right now. But the promise of our lifestyle is that you really can not only prevent these things from arising, but you can reverse them. You can turn those genes off. Just because, just because breast cancer is in your family doesn't mean you're doomed and that you need to have your breasts removed you know, preventatively. It doesn't work that way. This lifestyle works. It, is a, it, it, it can inoculate yourself the right way. The true, the true immunity you can immunity. build, you don't buy it. Now that's an excellent point. I think I agree completely with you that not only many chronic disease can be prevented, probably all of them, and they can be reversed very quickly too. And I think this COVID-19 is a big, big eye opener. I think people have been just taking it granted that if they develop chronic disease, the healthcare system and all these expensive procedures and medications will keep them going until they are hit with this COVID-19 with that of severity of illness then many of them have wake up call that uh, their chronic disease actually can kill them. See, I think many people, they're accepted now that diabetes is a new norm. Having a high blood pressure is a new norm. Having a stent is a new norm. But I think until they get COVID-19, they realize that those things are not norm. Those things actually are the underlying, uh, underlying volcanoes ready to blast off anytime when any kind of this kind of uh, emergency illness will come in. And that could be you know, COVID-19, that could be any other virus, that could be any other bacteria, that could be even any other accident. I think people who have chronic disease, when they get into any car accident, they have much higher chance of uh, you know, post-accident depression, post-traumatic disorder. They also have a higher chance of getting infections. So I think this chronic disease are just uh, just uh, like a like a tip of the iceberg, there's just so much more things happen to people who have chronic disease, and they really need to they really need to start learning that chronic disease are not norm. Many of my patients still believe that having a stand at age 70 is like a normal. They say all everybody in my family had a stand. Everybody in my family had a bypass. They assume this is their genetics, but like you said, epigenetics is much more powerful than the genetics. So my next question to you is, uh, you've been friends to all these great authors. So tell us top three books you will all our followers to buy. I know you don't want to do disservice to any of your great giants. I try not to do that, but everybody cannot buy 20 books. So tell us what top three books everybody should have at their house. Well, I think the, the first one to help you think straight about all this is uh, The Pleasure Trap, written by Drs. Alan Goldhammer and Doug Lyle. It was written some 20 years ago, and their, their observations about the impact of, of, on dopamine of the Pleasure Trap foods was they were the first to talk about that, but they were way ahead of their time. It's still a great book, and I think everybody needs to read that so you're thinking straight about, why the, about the addictive nature of, of, of the pleasure trap foods of salt oil and sugar and processed foods and what that does to you and why you, it's just another form of addiction. People think of addiction in terms of, uh, in terms of cocaine and heroin and, 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 and marijuana, but they don't think of it in terms of chocolate and, and, and ice cream and, and, and processed foods. This book will give you a, a, a healthier perspective on that. So I think it's a fundamental book 
uh, to do that. Joel Furman, Dr. Joel Furman, uh, the great Dr. Joel Furman, who I you know, had the privilege of growing up with uh, and still consider one of my best friends. He and his wife, Lisa, are best friends of ours. He just, his last, his, la his greatest, latest and greatest book, Eat for Life, is just a tremendous book. And, uh, and again, puts it all in perspective. So, you know, his book, and then there's, you know, there's a, a, a plethora. I mean, everybody probably, if, if they're in this world, has read How Not to Die by Michael yes. Greger. I mean, yes. it's a long book. It's a great read. But boy, you'll just be given the breadth of this, you know, of the whole food plant-based living. But fortunately, you know, there's new, there's new, um, uh, new ones coming out every day. Dr. Uh, Will Bolsowitz is featured yes, in an I article. Have he he yes. has his book, Fiber Fuel, just came out. It's a great book. There's book. more and more and more. They're all telling the same thing, but they all tell it in a, in a different way. And sometimes they reach people, you know, from their unique perspective. So somebody who, who you know, is, is, has heart problems is going to respond to a guy who writes a book about heart health, like, like Dr. Esselstyn. Yeah. Um, you know, people that are, you know, looking in the bigger picture, they're going to read the China study to see, to understand fundamentally um, what that, what that sort of stuff is all about. And, uh, so those are, uh, I guess, if I had to put the top of my list, I think the pleasure trap. And uh, this is just a little plug again for a cookbook. There's a million cookbooks out there in, in the vegan world. And Chef AJ's got great ones. And the Esselstyn's got great ones. My favorite, the NHA favorite, the staple in our house is Kathy Fisher's Straight Up Kathy Food. Fisher. It's the best. Because I think my, again, long experience in this movement is that there's a million vegan and vegetarian cookbooks. And some of them have recipes that are so complicated, you'll never make them. Kathy Fisher has a simplicity in her approach to recipes there, you know, the ingredient number, and she's flexible. And she, she'll she tell you, well, if you don't have this, you can use that. Yeah. And she even has her own section in there called My Meals, what she actually eats. So I think straightupfood.com is a great resource for people. And, um, and her book, Straight by the Same Name, Straight Up Food, is as good as it gets. And it's even a wonderful book because it, it, it's kind of spiral by, it sits flat on your, on your shelf. You don't have to put a, a bowl on one page to read the recipe. Yeah, it's just a great yeah. book. And it's probably with more, more recipes in the Huberman household come from Kathy Fisher's Straight Up Food. But there's such great, you know, YouTube channels, Dylan Holmes, Well Your World, the Giroudi yeah. family. Yeah. Uh, there's just great resources out there and more and more are coming every day. Yeah. No, I think I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, a specific author or a speaker may kind of uh, be become your liking and you may keep following. So I think uh, trying out everybody, and I think to be honest with you, instead of watching six hours on Netflix, read an hour or two every week. And I think in one or two years, you'll probably finish all the great books. So I think uh, we have a list of books on our page also, but I agree, I, I, I own all the books. I've read all of them and fortunately, <laughs> the authors are coming on our page. So that's a great feeling. My next they're question. All, the wonderful thing is they're all, they're all, apologize for that. They're all, um, they're all singing the same song. Yes. That's the beautiful thing. And I, I think if I had to qualify that a little bit, I would say, and that's where I think what I'm so proud of with the NHA is that we talk about, I think we represent the gold standard of the whole food plant-based living. As you say, being vegan doesn't mean you're healthy whole plant-based marijuana is plant-based tobacco is plant-based so yeah. i mean that, that term itself is a little loose we are in the nha we have been a hundred percent whole food um whole natural foods with without any added salt oil or sugar that's the gold standard that the nha has stood for for all of our 70 years and if you pick up health science magazine uh that we provide you won't that's what you'll find those are the recipes you'll find those are the articles defending that kind of lifestyle and, uh, and, and those kind of dietary choices. And uh, I consider it the gold standard. Great. So tell us a little bit more about your organization and uh, like how a person can become a member, how much it costs and what are the benefits? Sure. So we are, uh, uh, we are the oldest organization on the planet advocating the benefits of 100% whole plant food diet and lifestyle. That's something we've been doing since our founding, believe it or not, in 1948. I think I like to say that a lot of people think that the whole food plant-based health movement began when the China study was written or when Forks Over Knives came out in 2011. But we've been at this, we've been preaching this and teaching this 
uh, for a very long time. And I'm proud of the fact that at our annual conferences, which we've had since 1949, um, that is the, that is, those were the platforms in the early days, the only place where people like Neil Bernard and Caldwell Esselstyn and, and, and Michael Clapper, that's where they found their forums. That's where Joel Furman first appeared. That's where Alan Goldhammer first appeared and Frank Sabatino and these people continue to come because of our legacy role and, the, and, the, and I think the uncompromising principles that we've stood for for all these many years. So joining the NHA, we have a wonderful website. In fact, we're just about to launch a brand new website, but the URL is the same at healthscience.org. Um, it's to join the organization, it's $35 a year. Uh, and for that $35 a year, you get a subscription to uh, Health Science Magazine which I think is again, one of the finest magazines that you'll find because it's 40 pages long. It has no advertising in it. If you go to a health food store and pick up, or even if you, if you go to Whole Food uh, and get Forks Over Knives, which is a great magazine, but it's 70% recipes. That's kind of what they are. Health Science has a feature interview with people like you, with Columbus Batiste in the most recent issue, Michael Greger, uh, Neil Bernard, Michael Clapper, in-depth feature interviews with them, not just about, uh, about their health philosophy, but who they are as a person, where they came from, what they think about life, other, their other interests in life. So it's a really in-depth uh, sort of interview that I think people really find kind of like a, a feature of each issue. And then there are in-depth articles on, you know, on, on all of this, on, on epigenetics and, and the benefits of water fasting. And there's a great one in the latest issue on, on the, you know, the risks to our planet about what we're doing to our precious planet and things like that. So it's a great man. There's testimonials. There's recipes in it, but it's not a recipe magazine. There's six or seven recipes by, again, the gold standard chefs. And this latest issue is Brittany Giroudi, Chef AJ, uh, Kathy Fisher, Katie May. Uh, the real, you know, again, some of the very best appear. There's testimonials. And then I, the other thing I like to incorporate in them too in the magazine is uh, what I call timeless teachings. Because people in, in our movement, the founders of our movement, Dr. Shelton, Dr. William Esser, people like that have been, have been, have been had this insight and wisdom 50 years ago. And it's so interesting to look at it now, how far ahead of their time they were uh, uh, about this. So I think it's an interesting magazine, again, unique, 40 pages long. And when you join the NHA for that $35, you can register on our website and gain access to all 42 years of back issues of the magazine for free. Just you, you read them at your leisure, your pleasure, you can, it's all searchable. In addition, we have about 14 eBooks on the history of the natural hygiene movement, which again, I think are the real foundation of today's whole food plant-based health movement. Uh, and books like by Dr. Herbert Shelton, Health for the Millions, Fasting Can Save Your Life, probably the most important, most famous, most popular book ever written on the subject of fasting. If you went on eBay to try to find one or on Amazon, it would cost you about $55. If you're a member of the NHA, it's for free. You just download it, whether you're Kindle, your e-reader, whatever you have. Uh, so that's just, those are some of the benefits. And then we have an annual conference that we do every year. Um, we COVID-19 knocked us out this year, but we're just about to sign a contract for next year. And I think we do conferences as well as anybody does. There's a lot of great ones out there, but we attract uh, a real all-star lineup of speakers. Uh, we've, we This year we were having Brenda Davis and Michael Clapper and, and um, Michael Greger and Frank Sabatino and Alan Goldhammer. And so we, they're, they're quite, ex they're great experiences. And when you come, all your meals are included and you can eat to your heart's content and you don't have to worry about your weight. You don't have to worry about salt, oil and sugar. <laughs> And uh, there are some of the best recipes and great fellowship that you have. So those are all benefits of joining the NHA. Again, our website is healthscience.org. And if people are, uh, if, if they want to look before they leap and they email either me at mhuberman at healthscience.org or my wife Wanda at whuberman at healthscience.org, we'll send them a free PDF of the latest issue of the magazine. And if they like it and they join, We'll send them a hard copy while supplies last. As I told you, when Brittany Giroudi gave a shout out to us the other night, <laughs> my inbox has been exploding with people joining and wanting that hard copy. So we'll see how long they last. But it's a, it's a good magazine. And I'm really proud of the, of the, um, 
of the heritage, the legacy role that we play in this health movement. And maybe for me personally, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, you gain a, a personal satisfaction, uh, stress relief, meditation, spirituality by being able to interview and talk to, you know, some of these great leaders of our health movement. That's what I find too. My greatest privilege in life is that when I, that, that Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer and these people are personal friends of mine. When I just interviewed Columbus Batiste, met one of the great guys I've ever, ever met in my life and, and, and meeting Kim Williams. And I'm going to meet you one day soon. That's yeah. a real privilege. And to be able to, to do this in the, I wouldn't say the twilight of my life, the highlight of my life, being able to do what I love um, is a real privilege. And so I, and to have no, my I wife join that... me in that journey is even better. I think the way you describe the organization, only $35 a year, you get four health magazines, 40 pages long, packed with tons of you know, information, not just recipes. Plus you get access to last, what, decades and decades of the history of healthy, healthy leading and healthy lifestyle. Plus all the great eBooks you get. I think to be honest with you, all our followers who wants to be healthy should just, Join tonight, and I think uh, I think uh, we need we need person like you to lead this movement. I think when I talked to you first time, I immediately realized that because of you, and you already mentioned that because of you, many of the my giants have actually come and grown now. And I think you bring not just uh, your personal uh, life story and your legacy from your parents, but also your intelligence your work ethics, your passion, your compassion, and all those things are the what we need to make this moment exponentially grow. I think the time is overdue. We've been trying to do this thing for 70, 80 years, and we are not going anywhere. Even though we are doubling every year, still that doubling goes from two to 4%, four to 6%, 7%. We still are having a like a big uphill battle. And we need person like you, Mark, who can lead us and who can actually make all of us a, a great soldiers and you become the general and we advance this moment so rapidly. So I thank you for coming. I think if you have anything to say, to conclude to all our followers, obviously they all should become member of your organization, but please give us last two, three minutes of your final message to all our followers. You know, uh, I, I, um... I, I was, uh, I, I said my politics, I was a flaming liberal Democrat, sometimes for lost causes. And in 1972, I was a fan of George McGovern when he ran for president back when. But, and, and George, you know, he flamed out, but he was a great guy, actually was a, a proponent of, uh, of getting, you know, uh, getting nutrition education in schools and things like that. He was a really way ahead of his time, but not right politically, not at the right time politically, but he had a great, in his concession speech when he lost badly in the election, he said, I don't remember the whole remarks, but he ended by saying, uh, as you know, the campaign was so long and hard, but my joy is that I had such friends. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's kind of how I feel about this movement. I, I, I find it, I am so proud when I watch Joel Furman on public television. I am so proud when I watch, when I watch What the Health and I see Alan Goldhammer and Michael Clapper and these people, and, and, and when I see Caldwell Esselstyn, and to have Caldwell and Ann for dinner at our house, that's my joy. And this is a beautiful community. And I guess what I would say about joining the NHA, when you join the NHA, you not just become part of, you know, kind of a great legacy and all that, but you'll become friends of Mark and Wanda Huberman. I, I can tell you that it, this is maybe a, an impersonal world out there, but when people join the NHA, they get a personal email from Mark Huberman. I want to know what their story is. And we talk and we become friends. And when people come to our conferences, I think that's what they say it is. And I think the magazine is a, is a um, this can be a pretty lonely operation for people. If, if you're married and your husband doesn't, or your wife, one spouse doesn't go along, or, you're, or you're, you're doing this alone, it can be pretty lonely. And I think Health Science Magazine and the NHA and our conferences and our relationships is part of that community. And I think we all need that. And I think we provide that, and it's so um, it's neat to it's 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 neat to receive. It's really neat to give, and it's really neat to share. 
And I think that's what Wanda and I enjoy so much with the NHA. We've made such great friends and, and, and to be, you know, to be in the same common cause, it does as much for us as I, uh, hopefully it does for other people too. So that's what you really get. I think when you join the NHA, great information, great legacy, you're part of great legacy and great history, but you also become part of a community and, and you get that. My father, my late great father used to say, when you come to our conferences, he said, son, it, it recharges your battery. <laughs> I think we all need to get our batteries recharged like that. And when you get the magazine quarterly um, and you get on our email list and that you're, you're part of that community, it does recharge your battery. And you read, wow, what Frank Sabatino wrote about, about gut health and, and what Stefan Esser wrote about COVID-19, how to look at all this. I think that's, uh, that's the biggest benefit of all. You become part of a great community. And that's, I think, what we, that's well, I, what I think we give. I, I must conclude with one thing that uh, I saw your picture uh, about your wedding picture from 20 to uh, 29 years ago. And you both look same, thanks to Wanda. She really takes care of you well. Now she's in your movement. And I think to be honest with you, you have achieved this thing because she's right next to you. So big congratulations to you and Wanda. Keep working hard, keep working smart. We are all with you and we'll take this movement where it needs to go in next many Quickly, very quickly. Uh, you know, Detroit. Detroit is not that far from Youngstown. We we we'll, we'll meet someday soon. We will we will be meeting soon. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Good night. Have a great night.